In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most chaste spouse of the Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto you, my spiritual Father, and beg your protection. O foster Father of the Redeemer, despise not my petitions, but in your goodness hear and answer me. Amen. Heavenly Father, on this day 31 of our consecration to St. Joseph, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us as we stand in awe of our spiritual father, St. Joseph, and his title and his role as the terror of demons. Heavenly Father, we need him in that capacity today when there is so much evil that is on uh, the earth. There are so many bad things happening that we need uh, the terror of demons to fight back these evils. We pray for his intercession for ourselves, for marriages, for families, uh, for the church as a whole. Uh, we pray for this great protector to, to defend us, protect us, and keep us safe during these difficult times. As always, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to be talking today about, and I had no intention of saying what I just was going to say, but it, it, it goes perfectly into one of the guys we're going to be talking about today, Blessed Bartolo Longo. So we'll talk about him as we go through it. But man, that Holy Spirit just blows me away sometimes how, how that happens. Okay, so we got to be praying. And th this is the other thing that, that really worries me. Um is, you know, churches are starting to reopen, but a lot of people are, I'm hearing a lot of people say, Father, um, a lot of people are saying they're not going to come back to church. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Is it because they have, you know, the social distancing stuff and you can only get, you know, so many people have to get a ticket to go to mass and, you know, <laughs> all that situation. Is that what you mean? And they're like, no, no, no. I I'm talking about people who said, you know, even in light of that, even if things were back to normal, they're just not coming back. And I read an article yesterday <coughs> from a guy who gave a rationale for that. And he's worried too. And after reading his article, I was like, wow, that was so articulate. It was so well stated. And he made his point so well that as a priest, I was like, oh man, this is a problem. And here's why. You know, before we went into the the, the pandemic, you know, the whole coronavirus thing, um, we already had a lack of Catholics a majority of Catholics who don't have a Eucharistic faith. Remember, there was a, a survey that was taken, uh, I don't know, last year. It was last year, uh, early last year, I think. And it, it, it just random Catholics. It was like 70% of Catholics don't believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. They don't believe it. They think it's a symbol or they just don't get it or they're just like, whatever. 70%. What? So we went into this with that. Now that we've had so many people have lost, you know, they, 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 they don't look at the church now as a moral compass because of the scandals. And, you know, when basically we were considered in a non-essential entity, you know, people could go to Walmart and other places, but churches are, were closed and still are to some degree. Um, people are just like, yeah, I mean, I was fine. I can watch it on TV, you know, that, I mean, that's what a lot of people are saying. And that's what I'm hearing a lot of other priests telling me, like, this is going to be a problem. So we got to pray for this too, because we went into this pandemic with 70% of Catholics already not believing in the real presence. And then we had this stuff happen. Oh man, we are in a serious situation, guys. So we need to definitely be on our knees. And praying for something, in my opinion. Now, don't want to freak you out or anything, okay? But we need to pray for something apocalyptic, man. Something biblical. Because that's what we need. One of my professors, a Dominican professor, who's now an archbishop in, 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 in Rome, uh, Archbishop uh, Augustine de Noia, great guy. He um, said so often in our classes, he said, and this is 20-some years ago, the toothpaste is out of the tube. You can't put it back. Yeah, it's a silly little analogy, but it's true. You know, once that toothpaste is out, you can't, how are you going to get it back in? So we've gone so far right now with so many things that, in my opinion, uh, I think it's going to take a serious 
the hand of God in a big way. We need a shakeup. We need a jolt in a major way. Um, and I, I pray for that. And I, the reason is for conversions, for us to have a radical conversion as a, as a people back to God. Because we're, we're, we're off, man. We're so off. So my heart as a priest is worried because I'm, I'm like, when I read that article and I'm hearing brother priest tell me this, that people aren't coming back. This is, this is not good. This is not good. So we got to pray guys. We got to pray. All right. So let's get started. So here we are on day 31. And this is who this is this title. Mm -mm -mm. This is my favorite title of St. Joseph. I think it is for a lot of people. Terror of demons. Pray for us. So I start off with a quote from Venerable Mary of Agreda. Remember, she's the mystic. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph pursued their way through many towns of Egypt, driving out the demons, not only from the idols, but out of many bodies possessed by them, curing many that were grievously and dangerously ill. Mm. Well, that'd be interesting when we re rewind history and are able to watch that, you know, and think about it. I mean, at the mere presence of Jesus, when he was doing his public ministry, demons were coming out of people. Well, it's the same Jesus that was, you know, an infant and then a little boy, whether he was six years old, nine years old, 14 years old. And so demons would have recognized that presence and went shrieking and, you know, f fleeing at the presence of the God man. Remember, the devil knows Jesus. He knows who he is. All right. Demons fear Jesus. Demons fear Mary. Did you know that demons fear St. Joseph as well? It's true. Demons are absolutely terrified of St. Joseph. Evil spirits are terrified of St. Joseph because he alone is the spouse of the Immaculata and the father of Jesus Christ. St. Joseph is the gateway to Jesus and Mary. Everything that touches him becomes a relic. He saved the Savior from Herod, spent decades in adoration, exercised paternal authority over Jesus, and made it possible for Jesus and Mary to offer their sacrifice on Calvary. Demons have plenty to be afraid of in the person of St. Joseph. He is mighty. He is mighty. St. Joseph is a dragon slayer. I love this kind of stuff. You know, and today, people don't believe in dragons. I'm not, I'm not talking about Komodo dragons in Indonesia or wherever they live. Uh, I'm talking about dragons, serpent. You know, uh, the, that's how the devil is depicted because the devil was, uh, was an angel, but it's now deformed and, you know, is presented in Scripture as a dragon. That actual word presents in Scripture calls Lucifer a dragon, the ancient serpent dragon. The title Terror of Demons is the most unique title of St. Joseph. It's a fearsome and commanding title. It's the title of a warrior. The lily St. Joseph holds in his hand is a mighty spiritual weapon, a sword of purity. It has the power to pierce fire-breathing dragons, demons, and conquer every form of filth and darkness. The lily he wields is a threat to all the filthy forces of Satan. This is going to be really important as I go through about this purity with St. Joseph, which gives him so much power, as, especially as a man. And that's something that's so needed today. Demons are terrified at the mere, mere mention of St. Joseph's name. They fear everything about him. How terrified are they? Well, terrified enough that they fear when he slept. They feared him when he was sleeping. When he slumbered, he spoke to God. It doesn't matter if his mind and body are at rest. St. Joseph's spirit is always at attention and ready to protect, defend, and fight for Jesus, Mary, and souls. That's the real Joseph, by the way. Not the old guy in the background about to, you know, uh, take a nap or, or, or is using the lily as a cane because he can barely stand up. Mm -mm. That ain't the terror of demons. The terror of demons was awesome. He was so strong. Even physically, he had to be strong. This is the real one. This is why I did these images. This is why I commissioned the artwork and told the artist every detail that I wanted. And we had to go. It took a year to get all the artwork because sometimes, you know, they would come back with something. I would say, yeah, no, it still just looks a little too soft. Um, I didn't want him to be presented in, you know, too strong of a way for sure. But I wanted him to be masculine, strength, 
Something that as a child, you would run into the arms of a father like this. Protect me, daddy, because there are demons who want me. And I know that you've got the strength to, to, to defend me, to, to protect me. And that's what we need in the spiritual life. You know, because it doesn't matter how old you are. You know, because some people might think, well, that's, that's cute, but that's like for kids. So you don't think you're a kid? You don't think that you're a child? Remember after the resurrection of Jesus, he meets his disciples again on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And Peter and James and John are out fishing. Grown men, rough men. Uh, and Jesus calls out to them. And what does he say? Children, have you caught anything to eat? Why is he calling grown men children? Well, one, because he's God, right? And in the sight of God, it doesn't matter how old you are. You're always going to be a child in the sight of God. Well, in the sight of our spiritual father, it's the same thing. We're always going to be his children. It doesn't matter how old you are. And so we, we have to have that confidence to run to him for protection. So when St. Joseph rises from sleep, demons know he will promptly do the will of God and block their evil intentions. Whether St. Joseph is awake or asleep, all hell trembles before the father and king of the holy family. St. Joseph is a quiet man, but he is not a timid man. Just because he did, we don't have any words said from him in the New Testament doesn't mean that you know his words didn't have power. Actually, the one word that we know that he had to have said, though we don't see it written there, he it was his role to say Jesus, to give the child his name. That was what the angel told him. And you will name him Jesus. Wow. I, I mean, what better thing could you say? What better word could you have come out of your mouth? And to have it come from the terror of demons? Powerful. One glance of St. Joseph's eyes sends all hell into flight. One word from his mouth routes the forces of darkness as an axe levels a field of trees. Boom! One word from Joseph's mouth. Who can stand against you if the terror of demons protects you? That's your spiritual father. St. Joseph will protect you against Satan and his demons. Satan is not a myth. Neither are evil spirits and demons. The world considers these creatures to be fairy tales and legends, but they are real. We are in a spiritual battle, and Satan and his demons are out to get you. Now, I don't want to freak you out by saying that. You're going to sleep with your light on tonight. But you know what I mean. It's real. We have an enemy, a fallen angel, who wants to ruin everybody else. And so here's a statement from Peter. Be sober and vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith knowing that your fellow believers throughout the world undergo the same sufferings. And, and if you don't believe in the devil, I'm, most of you do. I'm preaching to the choir here. But just today, I heard, you guys got to look this up. Freaked me out when I was reading it. I read about a sister. Didn't look like she was a full, like, nun, you know, the full habit and stuff. But um, a sister, a teaching sister in Italy, um, three girls that she taught, catechism to you, man, teaching them the faith. They turned on her, lured her into a park, saying that, you know, they need, one of them needed guidance because she, like, was with child and was thinking about an abortion. That was how that they got the sister into the park. And then they did literally a satanic ritual killing of the sister. I mean, how sick and twisted is that? That's just crazy. Um... I mean, if you don't believe the devil is real, um, now, and I say this not to slight this country or anything, because it, it happens all over the place, but I'll, I'll tell you about an experience I had. Because um, I've heard manifestations, you know, where uh, a soul is uh, either possessed, uh, a person is either possessed or seriously, you know, got demons attached to them that things are just off and you, you, you get manifestations, whether it's something physical, something audible. Uh, stuff like that. So one time I went to Trinidad and I was down there. Uh, it was for a youth festival of some kind. I forget the name. And uh, great people. The sister there was just a zealous, zealous sister. And the priest, I think his name was Father Ian. This guy was a fire power, man. This priest was so powerful. 
And there was so many, there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids for the evening Eucharistic. It was like a praise and worship thing. And then there was going to be a Eucharistic procession, but there were so many that we had two monstrances with consecrated hosts, with our Eucharistic Lord there. And I had one and Father Ian had the other. And we were going to process through the crowd with our Lord. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I have never uh, experienced anything like that in my life. All of a sudden, some of these young kids were manifesting all over the place because, you know, there's a lot of, I don't even want to say new age stuff. It's even like worse. I think it's like the, the Santeria stuff or, or the, the voodoo, but all kinds of other stuff that was just really running rampant down there. And um, I mean, I was hearing two voices come out of the mouth of a girl at the same time. I heard this. I heard two voices coming out of the mouth of a girl at the same time. I saw another girl get thrown across, catapulted across. It wasn't a room. We were outside. Thrown. And then she falls and she just starts screaming like she's being murdered. And even though I'm holding Jesus in the monstrance, I'm like freaking out. I'm like, oh, man. And I'm like, hey, I'm Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are thou. I got Jesus in my hands and I'm tripping. And I'm just like, oh, my gracious. And then she starts to projectile vomit. I mean, it was like, boom, vomiting. And it was just like a flow. It wasn't like just one thing it just kept going i'm like oh man and all kinds of stuff was going on there was another kid uh was i was coming back because i was so disturbed by what i was seeing that i had to go back um to where you know there was like a little side chapel that had been set up um to place jesus there and just like wait because i was like what is going on here what is happening here it was freaking me out there was another kid who was on the ground slithering like a snake not kidding man so it didn't take long. Father Ian came back and he, he saw me in the little makeshift chapel and I was on my knees before the Blessed Sacrament praying. And he was like, everything good? You good? And I'm like, I'm like, what? Dude, am I good? I'm like, what the heck? What is this place? Like, what is going on? He was like, you've never seen something like this. I'm like, not like this. I'm like, holy mackerel, dude. I'm like, you, you, we need to get like news channels down here and film this because anybody that doesn't believe in the devil <laughs> needs to come to one of these things. I mean, it was like the whole chill thing on your spine. You might, you know, the, 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 my body was just like reacting to it. It was unbelievable. And so um, we prayed and we went back out and he was a powerhouse. He was used to this and he was just going up to people and he was just, you know, doing some serious deliverance ministry. And he was finding out who certain people were. And since he lives there, he, he knows a lot of them. He was going to, you know, do things later, like full on, you know, exorcisms and stuff. I was just like, Wow. Wow. So devil is real, my friends. There, and this wasn't psychological. Yeah. Okay. There's psych people have psychological things, but too many people today want to just blow it off and say, well, it's just psychological. Nah, nah. <laughs> that was full on possessed, bro. <laughs> full on possessions. And I still have never seen anything like that. And I've been a priest 17 years. That one experience was just wow. Okay. So let's go on into the wonder for today, which is St. Joseph, the terror of demons. You've met your match in St. Joseph. Oh, yes. So let's go to page 219. All right. So I start off with a great quote from St. Uh, Anthony Mary Claret. Oh, he's a great one. He's one of my favorites. He says, oh, glorious St. Joseph, pray for me, assist me, and defend me from Satan. Who's St. Anthony Mary Claret? Just briefly. Um, he was from Spain. He ended up uh, being made a bishop. And he was sent to, I think it's the it Cuba? I think it was Cuba. I hope I'm right on that. I, I haven't done the research on him in a while. But he's in my book on the rosary because he's a great champion of the rosary. Our Lady actually appeared to him on several occasions and told him that he was to be the new St. Dominic for our times because he loved the rosary so much. He mandated that all his priests pray the rosary with their people in their churches on Sundays and solemnities. And he would spy on them to make sure they were doing it. If they weren't, he would be in the back. He'd slip in. If they didn't, weren't doing it, he would walk right up and do it himself. He was so hated by the Freemasons in, I'm pretty sure it was Cuba um, at the time, that they stabbed him in the face. They stabbed him in the face. It didn't kill him or anything. Uh, Our Lady protected him. But he was, he was awesome. Uh, if you don't know about St. Anthony Mary Claret, check him out. He, he's a powerful one. All right. After the Virgin Mary, 
Demons fear St. Joseph more than any other saint. The devil fears St. Joseph more than he fears the Pope. Mm -hmm. How is this possible? Isn't the Pope the vicar of Christ? Yes, but the Pope is only the vicar of Christ. He's not the father of Christ. The vicar of Christ has authority over the mystical body of Christ, the church. But St. Joseph has the extraordinary gift and power of paternal intercession in heaven. Totally next level. Blessed William Joseph Chaminade says, The power of St. Joseph is greater than that of the ancient Joseph. Remember the one sold into slavery. Of Moses, of Joshua, and of St. Peter. St. Peter holds the keys, right? But St. Joseph held Christ himself. I mean, this is like next level, just like, you know, Our Lady is better than everyone else. Well, so is St. Joseph. The, uh, and here's the thing that amazes me is when I was putting this book together and I'm praying about it and I'm reading quotes like that from Blessed William Joseph Chaminade and others, I'm like, you know, this, the, the Catholic people need to know this because the two greatest people in all of Christianity were not popes, bishops, or priests or even nuns. You know what they were? A mom and a dad, lay people, Mary and Joseph. The greatest people in Christianity were laity. You guys who are watching this, uh, who are not priests, you know, and I, I don't think there's any bishops watching this, I, I hope, but I, I don't know, I doubt it. You guys, you should be so proud of that, right? I mean, the greatest people in Christianity were laity, Mary and Joseph. And that, that cries out to us, all of us, of course, that we're all called to holiness, that we're all called to be saints. And, you know, in a special way, uh, um, the majority of people watching this are laity, for sure. I'm probably 99%, right? Priests are busy. Many of them ain't got time to watch something like this. But mo majority of you are laity. And the majority of you, not all, but the majority of you are mothers and fathers. Wow. Have you ever thought of that? I mean, that is the norm for holiness. That's the norm. You're the norm. So are you doing it? Are you living up to it? You know, um, classically, we've talked about, and it's true, you find people today who say that it isn't, but these jokers don't know what they're talking about. Like there is an objective um, degree that if, if it, uh, of, of, of greaterness to the consecrated life in the priesthood, if it's lived faithfully, if it's lived faithfully, right? We, we, that's classic theology, that by surrendering your will and, and, and giving up certain, you know, wonderful things in life, like marriage and children, to living a life of consecrated celibacy, that, that has an objective degree greater than, you know, being laity. That's classic theology, but only if you live it faithfully. So what we're saying here is that if a lay person lives their vocation uh, perfectly, they can be so holy, so holy, and that's what you're called to. But someone who gives up, you know, so many things and makes that sacrifice, if they're faithful to it, well, then they're going to, their reward in heaven is going to be even greater. Now, people today, will, you know, so many people are, are, you know, trying to equalize everything on every level that they say, well, you know, everybody, it, it doesn't really matter. And it's like, no, that's not true. There is, this, there is this truth to this, but you got to live it. That's why, even if I'm a priest, if I mess this thing up, if I don't live my vocation, I'm not going to be holy according to my vocation. And, and everybody in, in a different vocation can be a gazillion times holier than I am. It doesn't matter that I'm called father. If I'm not living my vocation, mm -mm, that's actually going to be bad for me when life is over. Because can you imagine, just like when, when, a, when a cop goes to prison, ooh, Mm, that's not going to be good, right? Well, when a priest, God forbid, I don't even like saying this. Oh, Lord, have mercy on my soul, right? But if a priest goes to hell, oh, not good. Oh, I don't even like saying that. Let's stop that conversation. Pray for me. Don't want, don't want that. Scary, scary, scary. Okay, let's keep going here. Um, yes. So their laity, which is so extraordinary. That's the norm of holiness. 
That's the vast majority of people are called to sacramental marriage to be mothers and fathers. So ponder that, pray about that, and strive to live up to it. Okay, let's get into this guy. I'm not going to read through tons of his stuff, but I do want to mention him, this blessed Bartolo Longo. If you know me, you know that I'm very devoted to him. He's one of those saints that I pray to every day. Uh, and why? Because this guy was a fallen away Catholic who got involved in the occult and became an ordained satanic priest. Yikes, right? You, that's horrible. You can't get any further away from God. Um, and I'm not making that up. That's, you know, he, he writes all, all about that. But he had a radical conversion through uh, the rosary and built the world's fam most famous shrine to the rosary in Pompeii, Our Lady of the Rosary of Pompeii. I've been there. It's amazing. I've actually been in the presence of his, his body there, uh, Blessed Bartolo Longo. Um, I don't think he's incorrupt. It's a little odd. I, I think it's a wax coating. Um, I don't think that he's incorrupt. I was wondering that when I was there and I'm like staring at it like, is he incorrupt or what? It kind of looks real, but kind of looks like wax. Um, so, but he's there and, uh, and his wife is there, right? He was a layman. And, um, when he had his conversion, it was through the rosary, but he also had a tremendous devotion to St. Joseph, especially as the terror of demons, because he was coming out of the occult. And he was running away from, you know, that attachment that he had to the darkness. And so he ran to the terror of demons. And he wrote a book also called uh, The Month of Joseph. It's not in English. You can't find it in English. It doesn't exist in English. It's only in Italian. That's why every all the quotes in the book from him are the translations from that into English, appearing for the first time in English in the book. And he, oh, he so loved St. Joseph. And I have a few quotes that I want to read to you. Uh, from him. And he was beatified, by the way, a former satanic priest in 1980 by St. John Paul II. He says, Blessed Bartolo Longo, it is a great blessing for souls to be under the protection of the saint whose name makes demons tremble and fear flee. Mm. He also says, pronounce often and with great confidence the names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Their names bring peace, love, health, blessings, majesty, glory, admiration, joy, happiness, and veneration. Their holy names are a blessing to angels and men and a terror to demons. Christians should always have the names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph in their hearts and on their lips. We should. We should absolutely be doing that in a reverential way, of course. You know, this is another thing. Let me, let me, let me go off on a tangent here. A lot of people do this, and I even hear Brother Priest doing it, and it disturbs me sometimes. And I hear it in different cultures, too, and, and they think that, well, that's what my grandma said or what, what so-and-so said, and they just keep doing it. I, it needs to stop. Um, things like when you say, and I'm going to give you an example so, you know, that God understands what I'm doing here as a, a teaching moment. Stop saying, oh, my God, oh, my God, stop this, okay? So many people do this. And it's not right. Yes, it's not the same. You know, God's not his name per se. But at the same time, it's not good. It's not good to do that. It's just not right. I mean, imagine if 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 I were married, for example, and I had a wife named Linda, because Linda means beautiful. That's what it means. And all kinds of people would just always were like, oh, my Linda. Oh, my Linda. Oh, my Linda. Right. At some point, I need to speak up and go, guys, that's actually not cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? I love Linda. So this is not good. So if you're one of the people that do this, I'm going to challenge you right now. For the love of St. Joseph, for the love of God, stop it. Okay. Stop saying, oh my God. So many people do this and it's just, it's not right. It's not right. Now, maybe it's just me and I'm sensitive to this, but I don't think so because I know a lot of holy people and this also disturbs them. Say something else, you know, whatever it is, but uh, we have to stop that. And also, um, we're being told by Blessed Bartolo Longo to invoke the names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. But there's a proper place to do it as an invocation versus, you know, when something happens, when you, you know, slam your toe into the coffee table and you blurt out, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. No, don't do this. There's a big difference between doing it. You're basically wanting to say an expletive when something like that happens. Don't do this. I hope you know what I'm getting at here because I, I see this a lot. I see it even in other cultures, you know, when they say, you know, this this in their other language. Disturbs me. You know what's happening now? 
I'm seeing it more and more, uh, especially on TV. People taking the name of God in vain, for sure. But you know what's happening now? Because I think the manifestations of evil are becoming even more apparent. People are saying, now I'm going to say this as a teaching thing, because I don't even like to say it as an example, but I want to teach something here. People are saying, Mother of God. Have you heard it? I hear it all the time. I hear it in public. I hear people saying this, and I'm like, why are they saying this? Why are they saying this? They're not saying it in a reverential way, like, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray. No, that's what they're doing. They're saying Mother of God, using it like a four-letter word. Not kidding. If you're one of the people that do this, stop it now. This is this is not right. We should not be doing these things as a part of our vocabulary and speech uh, as, as a form of, of, of doing it in a bad way. It has to be done in a reverential way, okay? I hope I'm not being too strong with this, but somebody needs to say this kind of stuff because... It's disturbing to me, even when I hear like some people in my particular vocation doing the same thing. I'm like, dude, dude. All right. So I came up with a little litany, kind of, and it could be a much longer than the one that's here on page 220, um, for the things that terrorize the devil associated with St. Joseph. I mean, the list is probably for you go forever, but I have the fatherhood of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The humility of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The charity of St. Joseph terrorizes the devil. The poverty of St. Joseph. The purity of St. Joseph. The obedience of St. Joseph. The silence of St. Joseph. The suffering of St. Joseph. The prayer of St. Joseph. The name of St. Joseph. The sleep of St. Joseph. And there could be a ton more, right? But it's a cool little like litany. But there's two things I want to focus on for the rest of this particular wonder. Because they're the things I think today that particularly terrorize the devil. And that's the fatherhood of St. Joseph and the purity of St. Joseph. So all fatherhood has its origin in God and finds its earthly model in St. Joseph. All fatherhood has the power to combat evil. Lucifer fears the fatherhood of St. Joseph more than any other creaturely fatherhood because the devil knows that there is no created person who has a greater participation in the fatherhood of God than St. Joseph. And yet, all men are called to have that resemblance to St. Joseph in the exercise of their fatherhood. All men are called to fatherhood, whether biological or spiritual. All women are called to motherhood, whether biological or spiritual. That's why we call mother superior in a convent, right? Or even consecrated women. They fulfill a particular role that is motherly in their particular vocation. I have a few friends who are consecrated virgins. They don't live in a convent, but I can tell you this, the, the people that are, are around them and in their life, they are spiritually mothering them in so many ways. So all of us are called to this paternity. Well, right now, the, the devil is always, you know, hated, you know, motherhood and fatherhood. But right now there is something raging, raging uh, in the world, an attack on fatherhood. And I've gone through this before, but it's so clear to me what's going on, because as we're seeing this movement of greater devotion and awareness and now co total consecration to St. Joseph, the devil is trying so hard to go after fatherhood, really and truly. By the way, I'm not going to make any prophetic statements here, but I've prayed about this and I have to say, I'm kind of not surprised, and I, don't take this the wrong way. What's been going on is a tragedy. I don't want anyone to suffer. It breaks my heart. Anybody who's died from the you know, coronavirus, I, I don't want this. Of course not. But if you know anything about history, you know that when a new devotion was given to the world in the 13th century called the Rosary, that less than a century later, the Black Plague hit Europe and wiped out one, I think it was one fourth of the population of Europe. Like 25 million people died. And saints like St. Saint Louis de Montfort talk about that plague was the devil's way of trying to destroy this new devotion called the Rosary. This came out on January 1st, officially. That's the copyright date. Didn't take very long until another plague hit the planet. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I doubt that. I think that there's something spiritual behind everything that's going on. Devil ain't happy with this, my friends, at all, at all. 
and wants to destroy it. You know, when I was when I had this book in its uh, uh, non-printed format, when I had it on, saved on little, um, what do you call those little suckers? Those uh, things you plug into a computer, you know, those things that you save stuff on it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm the least tech person on the planet. Those, those little things. Um, I was worried that like my plane was going to crash and the whole thing would go down. And I, if I live or die, whatever. But, you know, I wanted this thing to be so published that I was actually making tons of these little, you know, thing, memory sticks, memory sticks. And I was like, literally, hey, dude, I know. Can you keep this in your house, please? And if I die, you got to notify so and so and get this thing published, because I was literally thinking that I was going to be taken out and this wouldn't be able to be published. And then there's other things that went down as well, even. Well, I'll tell you in heaven, there's a lot, there's a lot that went into getting, it almost wasn't done. So the devil, mm -mm, he's not liking fatherhood and he especially ain't liking that there's a brand new devotion uh, of, of serious content, you know, uh, substantially so in a consecration to St. Joseph now, because there's never been anything like it in 2000 years of Christianity. Oh, there have been people who have tried little ways and stuff and maybe a little, you know, five day thing or a, a nine day thing. But it's just been a few prayers. It hasn't been anything substantial at all. But uh, now that there is, the devil is not liking it at all. And here's one of the reasons why. It's a commandment from God that we honor our father and our mother. We were commanded to do this. But for so long, so many people, not out of ill will, as we've said, they just have not been honoring their spiritual father in the way that they should have been. And now that we are coming to this greater knowledge of who St. Joseph is, we're going to we're going to pour crazy amounts of honor upon him. And that's what I've been saying. I, I pray that the church does something super notable, acknowledging him. That's what I'm praying for. And that's really going to tick off the devil. Good. Because we need we need to turn back. And we're only going to be able to do it by getting this headship that's meant to be, you know, leading the family, protecting the family, serving the family, dying for the family, claim it back, get it back in families, get it back in parishes with father. We need it in bishops. We need it in everyone. Every man is called to be a reflection of the fatherhood of St. Joseph. And that's what the devil doesn't want people to know. That's what he doesn't want people to know. And that's what I'm desperately trying to get out to the world. In taking on human nature, the second person of the Blessed Trinity chose a life of submitting to, obeying, and honoring mortals. That's extraordinary. The fact that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords obeyed the fourth commandment himself. Remember, honor your father and mother. And submitted himself to the authority of St. Joseph on earth is incomprehensible to Satan. The devil hates this, that God took on flesh and then obeyed a man, a mere mortal, a creature, and called him dad. Oh, the devil. Oh, my gracious, that the devil doesn't like that. God lowered himself to obey and serve creatures made from dust. The filial obedience of Jesus to St. Joseph was met with the disdain of the devil. St. Joseph's fatherhood has power. The devil hates that Jesus and Mary obeyed the loving directives of St. Joseph. And now in heaven, the intercessory power of St. Joseph poses a serious threat to the wiles of the devil, and the devil knows it. Again, Blessed William Joseph Shamanad says, The Eternal Father shares with St. Joseph the authority which he has over the incarnate word, just as God shared with Adam his authority over creatures. Wow. Here's another great quote from St. Madeline Sophie Barat. She's a great saint. I went to her uh, tomb, uh, I think it was two years ago, in France. She says, The two greatest personages who ever lived on this earth sub subjected themselves to St. Joseph, Jesus, and Mary. That's extraordinary. And the devil knows it, and he doesn't want you to know it. He doesn't want you to know the secret power the, uh, of St. Joseph, the secret weapon of Christianity that's been, you know, kind of uh, hidden. Just like in a war, right? Have you ever seen those, those movies where there's a war going on and the guys are shooting with their, their guns and all of a sudden they're out of bullets or their little guns aren't, aren't working with the big artillery on the other side. And then somebody comes in 
and flips over the, the, the tarp that was covering the big Gatling gun. And all of a sudden, right? Well, that's St. Joseph on the spiritual battlefield. He's been covered and cloaked, fully loaded, ready to go. And now is his time when so much is under attack and under threat. And there's such craziness, both civilly and even in the church, there's crazy stuff going on. We need to bring out the big guns. We need to bring out the terror of demons. Just like this. Knock it off. Stop. This is St. Joseph. All right. So let's go into um, the purity of St. Joseph because this is huge, especially today. More so, I think, than probably ever. It is a tragedy that the majority of art depicting St. Joseph has presented him throughout the centuries as an elderly man. Why is this a tragedy? Because, you know, sometimes in these depictions, he's often depicted as soft and even effeminate. Have you seen these? I have many of them. And some of them, I, I don't say that they're not beautiful or anything, but it's like, he's just like, you know, give him a parasol and a pink, something pink. I mean, it's like, what the heck? I mean, it just looks like, what? That doesn't strike me as the terror of demons. It just doesn't. And so that, no man who sees that looks at that and goes, I want to be like that. I want to imitate that. No. When a man sees a man, he says, I want to be like that. I think I said this before, you know, but guys, they don't want to follow Pee Wee Herman into battle. They want to follow, you know, Patton or Rambo or Braveheart. I mean, this is just, men know this instinctively. Really and truly, you ladies listening, maybe you don't get it, but guys, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly what I'm talking about. And so that's why we need a depiction of St. Joseph that shows him he doesn't have to be depicted with a six-pack ripped and all buff and everything, although I'm sure he was physically strong, chopping wood and lifting stones and all that. Are you kidding me? Of course he was. But he has to be pre presented in a way that is going to give men something to want to be like. Every boy should want to be like his dad. And so when you, when you have a, a, an image of your, your spiritual father where he's about to croak, <laughs> that just doesn't do it. And that's why for almost 2,000 years, so many men have not sought to imitate St. Joseph. And he hasn't been brought up. And, you know, you talk to so many people, and that's the image of him that they have. And they just as soon turn to some other saint for intercession, which is fine. I mean, we need to go to all the saints, of course. But we bypass him. Well, that, that's got to change, especially today when we've got this filth on the planet, this absolutely perverse pornographic craziness going on like we've never had before. This stuff is just a mouse click away. It's everywhere now, both hard, soft. It's everywhere. It saturates us on a daily basis. All right. Saint, remember, St. Joseph is a dragon slayer. His lily is not the cane of an old man. It is the lance of a knight. Rare is the artist who has depicted the lily of St. Joseph as a sharp weapon piercing the serpent dragon. Well, that's all going all to change now. Oh, it's all going to change now. Because we've got to get artists who do stuff like this or something like this, where that lily, the child Jesus, is pierced. You can't see it because I'm sitting in front of it, but you've seen the image as I hold it up. You can go to the website and see it. It's piercing that serpent. That's father and son, like father, like son. He's raising up the God man to be that warrior, that knight, that one who's going to be a dragon slayer and ultimately slay the beast. That's the son of Joseph. He's in his manhood. He's learning all this stuff from Joseph, not an old man who's taking naps in the afternoon and has a forgetful memory, but a man who is a warrior, a knight, a soldier, not afraid to wield an axe. That's St. Joseph. That's the mighty terror of demons, my friends. All right. What the church needs today are images that depict St. Joseph as a dragon slayer. He worked with many tools, chopped wood and swung a sharp axe. Such images are needed in homes and churches today. Imagine, man, if you walked into a Catholic church and there was a statue like this. <laughs> you get some men coming back. I'll tell you that right now. You get a statue like this in your church and men are going to be like, oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. This is what's attractive to dudes. And, you know, this is real big reason why we don't have a lot of dudes who are super thrilled about church. 
Now there's own issues, right? Because it, ultimately it's all about the Eucharist. So if, even if everything else totally stinks, um, it's all about the Eucharist for sure. But imagine, imagine if we had stuff like this, if, if, and even if you couldn't get a statue of it, let's just say, although if you're, if you're a sculptor, I beg you from the depths of my soul, make something like this. We need stuff like this everywhere. Imagine if we, we had a statue like this in front of St. Peter's. Oh, I know there's a whole history to that obelisk that's in front of it. I could care less about a stinking obelisk, right? Tear that stinking thing down for all I care. I'm not into historical, you know, whatever. It's It, it looks Masonic to me. Get rid of it, right? But put something like this up there. <laughs> I think that'll change things. I'm just saying. Maybe I'm wrong. But I don't think so. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to come across arrogant or anything, guys. But to me, this stuff is like a no-brainer. You want to get guys signed up for battle? Every guy knows that he, he, he instinctively he's made for this kind of stuff. It's just that when all the women take over and everything just gets turned into pink and flowers and doilies and whatnot in church, guys are just like, <laughs> you know. But if you get guys trained to be spiritual warriors, to, to be, uh, you know, uh, proactive, I, you could change things. You really could change things. That's why when I went to Franciscan University for my undergraduate degree, they have things there called households. They don't have like fraternities or sororities. They have something different. It, it's it's um, a household of faith and they have different titles and different uh, kind of uh, apostolate things that they do. And they're fantastic. I signed up to be in the one called the, the Knights of the Immaculata. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Absolutely love it. Because that that's that's kind of, I think, what appeals to men. All right, so let's see here. Um, the purity of St. Joseph is a weapon against the filth and perversions of the devil. Satan is a filthy, perverse, and pornographic creature. He is. He twists things. He doesn't want things to be used in their proper sense. He wants them to be abused. Um so it, the, the purity of St. Joseph pierces the devil. The number one sin among, among men today is impurity. How do I know this? Well, I do a little something called hearing confessions. I can't tell you the content of the confessions. You know, I can't, I can't do that. It's a sacred seal, thank God, right? But let me tell you this. There is no other sin among men today that even comes close to this whole pornographic filth. It is numero uno among the sins of men because men are naturally drawn to the feminine mystery and wonder and shape and sound and all of that. It's what we're drawn to naturally. The devil knowing that can, can get men so warped and messed up by, you know, baiting them with what they're naturally drawn to. And the devil knows that and he's taken advantage of that with this pornographic stuff. I mean, what is it now? I think the last time I checked, it was that boys, by the, at least in the United States anyway, I think it's probably universal, um, by the age of 11 are exposed to hardcore pornography. By the age of 11. Do you know what that is going to do when they grow up and how they're going to be so twisted and their desires and their intentions and their infidelity and all of this? Because, you know, what they see, they want to do. It's just how it works. And so this is why we have this contraception, you know, everywhere, because they don't want to reap the responsibility of their pleasurable acts. And they don't want to be faithful to just one when there's so many others. And, and you know, it's just sick. It's twisted. And this is why we have divorce rates at an all time high. Everybody's contracepting. And it's just we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. And that's another reason why we need the terror of demons to combat this, this filthy, perverse era in which we are living, because it saturates everything, everything. All right. Um, the spirit, oh yes, it is, pornography is a spiritual plague, destroying the minds and hearts of men on a global scale. The spiritual plague of impurity involves pornography, immoral actions with oneself, homosexual acts life, and lifestyles, pedophilia, cohabitation, contraception, and abortion, and probably a ton of other things. These sins leave men powerless and spiritually impotent. Men who are impure have no power. 
Impure men pose no threat to the devil because they are spiritually impotent. This explains why so many men today have no strength to fight evil. The devil doesn't fear many men today because they're not terrors of demons. Satan has nothing to fear from a man who has freely chosen to let demons into his life through lust, pornography, immoral desires, and every other form of perversion. A filthy heart blinds a person to the countenance of God. Remember, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. If men want to see God and have power over darkness, they must strive to have a chaste and loving heart like St. Joseph. They must become another terror of demons. Man up, boys. This is what we got to do. I'm not saying it's easy. Look, I'm a sinner like the rest of my brothers, right? I'm not a robot or an angel. It's not easy. But we got to strive for this. This is what we have to do or we're never going to see a turnaround. If we let this thing continue, it's just going to snowball into something that is out of control and we've got a massive avalanche and everything is going to collapse. This is what we're dealing with right now. But so many people, they don't see it that way. You know, I think, what is it, the, 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 the most uh, uh, frequently hit uh, website in the world? I'm pretty sure it's, at least it's in the top three, I think. But I think it's actually the number one. You know what it is? Pornhub. That's so messed up. That's so messed up. We've got we've to counter this. We've got to go against this. All right. So I think I pretty much hammered that issue. Um, let's see. Oh, here, I'll end with this, and then we'll get into, oh, two more things, actually. Um, skipping some here, you're going to have to read it on your own. It's a really deep section with a lot of stuff to, to cover. Pope Leo XIII, over 100 years ago, one of my favorite popes. Why this dude ain't a saint blows my mind. Personally, I think it's because a lot of the modern, modernists don't want him to be canonized. They don't want a pope like that to be canonized. That's my personal thoughts, because that guy was out of control. He did so much good. He cranked out 11 encyclicals on the rosary. Are you kidding me? No pope has even come close to doing something like that. Gave us a St. Michael prayer, beatified Louis de Montfort, you know, uh, Bernadette Subiru. And it, so that dude did so many things. It's, it's unbelievable. One of the things that he did was he gave us a new prayer to St. Joseph. And he said that he particularly wanted it to be prayed at the end of the rosary during the month of October. Now, you don't have to only do it at that time, um, but learn this prayer, um, or at least get it. But um, it's a long prayer, so it's not going to be an easy one to remember right away, but it's powerful. I'm not gonna, I have it here. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it, it is long, but it's powerful. Invoking, you know, saying, just as we invoked Our Lady in the praying of this rosary, we now, to thee, St. Joseph, we ask your protection. And it is a powerful prayer. And it invokes him as the terror of demons to help us in our current situation. And the Pope came up with that over 100 years ago. Think about how much we need that today. So if you're not familiar with that prayer, it's in the book. It's on page 224. And it's in the back of the book in the prayers. And if you don't have the book, get the book, please. But go online and find it. It usually says, to thee, O blessed Joseph, or to you, O blessed Joseph, the prayer of Leo the Thirteenth to be prayed over after the Rosary during the month of October, but you can do it anytime. All right, so I'm going to end this section with uh, two. Uh, uh, I guess they're prayers or they're statements from Saint uh, Padre Pio. Everybody loves Padre Pio, and everybody knows that the, you know he duked it out with the devil, and um, you know he he was one of the greatest saints I think of uh, the the 20th century. And then a quote from that blessed Bartolo Longo, that former satanic priest. So here's the quote from St. Padre Pio. St. Joseph, with the love and generosity with which he guarded Jesus, so too will he guard your soul. And as he defended him from Herod, so will he defend your soul from the fiercest Herod, the devil. All the care that the patriarch St. Joseph has, has for Jesus, he has for you and will always help you with his patronage. He will free you from the persecution of the wicked and proud Herod, and will not allow your heart to be estranged from Jesus. Ite ad Yosef. Go to Joseph with extreme confidence, because I do not remember having asked anything from St. Joseph without having obtained it readily. Wow. Padre Pio. You know him. Dude with the stigmata who was just like, 
next level of holiness, right? I mean, he's saying it. He's just recovering this whole tradition from St. Teresa of Avila and St. Thomas Aquinas and all the great ones, and he sums it up there really nice. The devil is the fiercest Herod. He's out to kill you. He's out to destroy you. And we need to run to St. Joseph to protect us. All right, the last one from Blessed Bartolo Longo. Your name, Joseph, is the joy of heaven, the honor of earth, the comfort of mortals. Your name invigorates the weak, comforts the afflicted, heals the sick, softens hardened hearts, helps us in temptation, frees us from the snares of the devil, obtains every gift, and shares in the power of the holy names of Jesus and Mary. Amen, 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 right? Awesome. Okay, so let's pray our Litany of St. Joseph, and today we do it in English. So that's on page 233. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Noble offspring of David, pray for us. Light of patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Chaste guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster father of the Son of God, pray for us. Zealous defender of Christ, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph most just, pray for us. Joseph most chaste, pray for us. Joseph most prudent, pray for us. Joseph most courageous, pray for us. Joseph most obedient, pray for us. Joseph most faithful, pray for us. Mirror of patience, pray for us. Lover of poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of domestic life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Comfort of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of the Holy Church, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. He has made him Lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. Let us pray. O God, who in your loving providence chose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of your most holy mother, grant us the favor of having him for our intercessor in heaven, whom on earth we venerate as our protector, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great and mighty terror of demons, St. Joseph, our spiritual father. In these days when so much is under attack, especially marriages, families, priests, all forms of fatherhood, that St. Joseph would come to our aid and protect us, shield us under his cloak, and help us to have pure hearts like his, so that we can combat the forces of darkness, so that we can be strong in our faith in resisting the devil who is like that roaring lion seeking to destroy us and devour us. Heavenly Father, give us this mighty protection of St. Joseph, the terror of demons, and instill in the hearts of artists, those who, who have the skills to make images, sculptures that depict St. Joseph as strong, as masculine, and as the mighty terror of demons. And as always, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And my friends, may Almighty God bless you, your family, and especially for the conversion of loved ones. The blessing of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.